I'm going to try to talk to you about single cell epigenomics in the context of the HCA today. Uh, I'll start by trying to put it in context, so make an effort not to go into any specific paper or, uh, or result, but like give perspective. So I think that the first statement I, I want to I wanna make, you, you don't have to agree, okay, is that the human cell atlas is initially driven by our ability to massively survey molecular footprints of tissues at single cell resolution. So it is the genomic component, it is this power to assess millions of cells in a systematic and robust and, and automated way that makes this thing actually possible. And there are a lot of talks this morning, throughout this morning, about all kinds of questions on how to really define it, but I think that still this is the essence, okay? So it's the ability to, to replace microscopy that was looking at very few cells traditionally to replace genomics that was trading off the microscopic resolution by bulking cells together, putting them together into something that can separate, uh, separate tissues into individual components. So the cell is at the center here. And for, for probably quite, a while, for quite, quite some time in, in the lifetime of this project, the focus is going to be linear, so to speak. So it is going to be on taxonomy and hierarchical classification of, of cells. And, and that's important, okay? So 20th century science seems to have gave very bad reputation to this idea of stamp collecting, but, but we need to be proud stamp collectors for at least a while, because that's the essence. That, these are the new building blocks that, that we, wanna, we wanna try and build. So starting with simple classification, expanding it, correcting it in some cases, that's very, very important. It, not, it is not something we can like dash through, and, and perhaps even this will be an enormously amazing and important contribution to biology. But, okay, so it, people are very eager to, to, to go through 300 years of science in just a year or two, so, so they want to quickly go from the linear stage to sort of the Darwinian, Waddingtonian um, mindset in which the idea is to take those classes and order them, organize them into developmental hierarchies, and then even try to substitute some of those hierarchies with trajectories and, and talk about gradual differentiation, canals, and stuff like that. Which is, of course, also, it's very, very exciting. Uh, here, our situation or our scalability is perhaps less ideal, but there are very promising technologies toward these directions. But even if we, we are able to do like a systematic procedure for tracing lineages of many, many cells and cell types, we will remain with, with some essential problem, which is part of the essence of biology. And this is the fact that, that cells are not like deterministic machines, and that our body is not working like according to a very well-defined C. elegans blueprint, always everything is happening the same. It's just not like that. We know that already. We don't need a project to, to tell us that. So there are many different states that can merge into uh, some idealized molecular state. So we can categorize and do the taxonomy of those, of those states, even if things are not deterministic, because they are simply there, and it seems that biology is allowing us to do it because the, the level of complexity or the number, the total number of states that are probably present in my body is not infinite, okay? And it is highly constrained by all kinds of evolutionary and other physiological constraints. But it doesn't mean that the, 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 the flow of states to where this idealized molecular state is always the same. And it has become even more challenging when, it, when we try to think about the future. And it was mentioned here in one or two talks that, you know, we are going to take snapshots of cells and to characterize them and to try to generalize what we observe from one individual or one tissue into other tissues and make predictions or eventually generate medical applications, which are, some of them are really within reach. But if we want to predict how a certain cell state can respond to, to, to even to, uh, to time, as time goes on, or more acutely to all kinds of interventions, drugs. Uh, this is something that is not necessarily present in the information that defines the state. And I think that this is probably where 
uh, where epigenetics is becoming really, really important. So my statement, again, you don't have to agree, is that single-cell epigenomics may facilitate understanding of regulatory mechanism, developmental potential, and the disease risk at the single cell level, something that will be very difficult to do with other types of molecular aspects of the cell, for example, transcriptional analysis. So, you know, it, I think that it is our most direct link to the mechanism underlying cell state persistence, diversification, and also deterioration in disease. So it gives us something about the cell past, also something about the potential future. So why do I think why do I make this statement? There are all kinds of evidence in, in, in research of the last 50 years on, in epigenetics that suggests that at least some of it is true. And again, it is not clear at what level. And, but at least it seems that, for example, DNA methylation is participating in stabilizing the, uh, the cell's regulatory program. So it means that you can take two cells that are identical according to their transcription and profile, but here is an idealized methylation profile of them. Here is an enhancer. Maybe the enhancer is not methylated here, and it is methylated there. And it is possible that when a signal will come, the guy, the cell that is indistinguishable according to transcription, but the enhancer is unmethylated, will respond, and the other guy will not. So it gives us additional capability to predict the state or the, the future states of this cell. Another example are chromosomal conformations. So all those, this genetic or epigenetic information is, is of course folded inside a nucleus. Here's a, a, a single cell model of, 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 of a haplotype uh, embryonic stem cells divided into the, the individual chrom chromosomes. So we can do it today, we can profile uh, cells, the cell's chromosome at a single cell level. So again, two cells that may be completely indistinguishable at the transcriptional level, one of them and both of them may have this enhancer unmethylated, but one of them may have the conformation already set up such that the signal we talked about is going to fire and transcription will happen for, for this gene, while another one will be tethered to the lamina and then nothing will happen. Okay, so this is just a, a motivation. So can we actually do it? Because so far, uh, it, it didn't really happen, okay? There are all kinds of interesting stats. Why is that? So single-cell RNA-seq, it was mentioned here, uh, was developed over the last few years and was considerably scaled from initial studies that spent over one million reads per cell uh, for very little, co very small cohorts to routine or, and, and very effective techniques that allow us to, to profile thousands of cells at an overall budget of something like 50, 100,000 reads per cell. And note that I'm, I'm budgeting here uh, using the number of reads because this is currently, in terms, in, in economical uh, terms, that's the rate limiting factor for single cell analysis. So, so it doesn't really matter how many cells we can do now, it's, it's the economy that, that really bound us from, from doing like millions and billions. But that's already very, very nice, okay? It means that we can routinely do experiments with thousands of cells. When we talked about single cell bisulfite sequencing, which is uh, one of the major methods for, for profiling DNA methylation, situation so far was a bit problematic, where at least millions and sometimes even 10 or 20 million reads per cell were needed, uh, and only relatively few, let's say 100. There are some essays by Christoph Bock and Wolf Reich that, that cross the 100 cell barrier, but it is still very expensive. But I think that several emerging techniques are now allowing us to go down to where the 100, 200, 300,000 reads per cell and still do targeted by software sequencing and profile, uh, something which is very, very interesting uh, uh, that will, will tell us a lot about the, regula the regulatory potential of a cell, namely targeting enhancers. If we are talking about high C, Again, the situation previously was that it was very expensive and not very high throughput. Today, there are, uh, there are uh, tools out there that we, we can now routinely do hundreds and thousands of single cell IC. And again, in, in lowering the, bear, the sequencing burden way beyond, below the one million reads per cell to where 200 or 300,000. So, and, and of course, people are talking a lot about ATTAC. Another technique that allows us to, to profile and map a chromosomal state at, at high throughput. 
multi-level profiling, that's still much more challenging and will have to be further explored. So I want to spend a few minutes, uh, I don't have much more than that, to give you like my insight into why and what kind of single cell epigenomics techniques, which of them should work and which should not, or will be harder to, to scale. So single cell RNA-seq is a wonderful example of scalability. And one of the reasons is that even though we are sequencing just some of the RNA in the cell, let's say 5% if we're kind of optimistic, okay, the signal-to-noise properties of this are very, very good. Because once we sequence an RNA molecule, we're almost sure it was there in that particular cell. So that's a very strong statistical property for this assay. And it means that it can scale. I don't have time to go into these pseudo equations here, but it means that the noise or the, sorry, the standard deviation or the, the, the variance on the estimation of the, of, of the concentration of RNA in a cell is scaling very nicely with the number of cells we are actually profiling. So like one over the square root of the number of cells, roughly speaking, okay? That's very, very nice, okay? This is why single cell RNA-seq essentially is so successful. Uh, DNA methylation, if you are thinking about that, is also something which is extremely scalable. And the reason for that is that the individual bit we are profiling when we are doing single cell methylation profiling is a bisulf, if we are doing bisulfite sequencing, is something that has very low positive and negative uh, uh, rates, false positive, false negative rates. Because once we are sequencing the molecule, we know what the methylation was in that particular cell. Recovery and is, is maybe very far from optimal, but when something is missing, the data is missing, we know that it is missing. It, we are not interpreting it as any kind of signal, something we have to do in single cell RNA-seq or in other techniques. So it also means, and I don't have time to go into the equations, we can talk about it later if you want, that scaling is going to be guaranteed and will, will be very, very, very attractive. If you are talking about high C, situation is, is a bit different, but also scales very well, because here we are measuring specific contacts, and the contacts are true with very high probability. Of course, we are sampling just some of the contacts that define the chromosomal conformation, but here we have a very strong structural constraint, so it's, it may be the only case where we can really do imputation in single cell epigenomics, because there are certain configuration of contacts that are simply not feasible. At, 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 the, at the structural level. So this can, seek, this can scale very well. Many, many other single cell epigenomics techniques are, are out there, are being developed, and we can examine their, their ability to scale them toward what we really want to achieve. And, and I think there is, there is a great room for, for, for and very, many, many, many promises for, for interesting things that can be done with that. So just to summarize, single cell Epigenomics may have more impact when we apply it to something that carry memory. We, we want to go beyond the phenomenology of single cell RNA seq, so we need something that reports on on the potential of, of cell uh, to, to respond to something. So it means that we need to profile something that is carrying that the cell carries with it clonally. So memory features, epigenetic features that are clonally more stable than RNA. Uh, we have to discuss and to think very carefully how we want to integrate epigenomics with RNA. So do we want to profile each of them separately and integrate them using any kind of markers? Or do we want to actually go all the way and profile them together, which may be more expensive and complicated? That's very open. And finally, I'm, 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 I'm going back to this statement where Single cell epigenomics may facilitate understanding of regulatory mechanism, developmental potential, and disease risk. Okay? I really think it gives us remarkable opportunities for the long-term goals of the HCA. I think that maybe unlike some of the other cut, super exciting cutting-edge technologies, for example, imaging, spatial mapping, that, that goes deep into physiology, tissues, things that we, we will have a very hard time to define precisely, Single cell epigenomics is still talking about the intracellular state, and it is something that is compatible with a very systematic effort for mapping all the cell states in the human body. So I think for that, it, it deserves a place of honor in this project. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
I totally agree with you that it deserves a, a place of honor and uh, the technologies fortunately are, are rapidly developing uh, at a rate that will allow it to have this place. We have time for a question or two. It may be an unfair question, but if on the Go spot, for it. Go for no, it. but if on the spot and you had to choose one, assuming that you can make choices and change them later, but if you had to choose one now of the single cell epigenomics no, methods I, in terms I'm, of scale, I'm, is, I'm strongly biased, but I think that bias is good. But I need that we, we, we need to make the effort to make methylation profiling methylation being the one sufficiently scalable, but already almost scalable, and we will gain much more from that than we can gain from other types of techniques. Because in terms of, as a memory carrier, we don't have very good evidence for any Anything other of else. the epigenetic mechanism that they are really participating actively in, in something that is different from, you know, transcriptional memory. Transcription also have memory, okay? The cell cannot forget its transcriptional state after a cell division, but, but, but DNA methylation have another way of propagating, which, which is very important, I think. Hello. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you, there was, you know, one of the issues with epigenetics at the single cell level seems to be the, you know, number of reads you need to kind of, you know, sample enough and then there's a, still a quite high dropout. Is there any thoughts about how to maybe only um, sample the most informative, um, yes. you know, parts of the, tra uh, the epigenome? Yeah, I think that's, that's a critical point. Uh, and I think this is partly what what stopped epigenetic, single cell epigenetics from getting into production in many labs. It's, and, and I think, but on the other end, the combination of, of doing targeting, targeted sequencing of, of enhancers, for example, and bisulfate sequencing or other techniques is, is actually something that is very practical today. And if you want to think about it, okay, this project it comes after many years of efforts, the Human Genome Project, ENCODE, the roadmap, okay? We have the opportunity to leverage on a lot of the achievements of those, of course, the genome project, but also the systematic efforts to map the epigenome are giving us the building blocks that we need to focus on. Of course, there will be more, okay? But at least 95% of the information is there. And, and once you are capable of, of capturing it, profiling it in a, in, a, in a robust way with minimal false negative, then the paradigm that is working so well for RNA, which is pull the cells and study the, the distribution inside the pools, will work. It is working. Okay, let's thank Amos again.